Anyway, I'd like to tell you a bit about the work, some of the work that we're trying to do, which is um, trying to improve imaging for prostate cancer, and I'll try and explain why. So I just, I just need to tell you I have some shares in a company that um, is working out through one of the patents that I did, but it's not relevant to this, but I'm obliged to tell people by law. So this is a man's journey through prostate cancer. And um, I don't know if there's a mouse I could move. Does the arrow come up? No, never mind. I'll just explain. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see that diagnosis occurs. But probably by that stage that diagnosis occurs, men have maybe had the disease for five to 10 years already. Um, and then uh, the choices seem to be either watchful waiting these days, it used to be surgery or radiation, but if you have a low Gleason score, and probably all of you know what a Gleason score is, it's a grading of the cancer, and there are two um, bits that they look at. They say the bit that's the worst and the bit that's, I mean, sorry, the bit that's the most common has a grade from one to five, and the next bit that's the next most common has a grade from one to five and they add those two numbers together to make the Gleason score. So if your Gleason score is six, it's um, now considered to be pretty mild and you might be advised to go on watchful waiting rather than having an operation. But if it's seven or above, then usually the choices are that you should do something actively about it, like an, an operation or having radiation. <coughs> So most men after that get better, but some men then after a few years um, find that they have a rise in PSA, that's the blood test for prostate-specific antigen. And the reason that it's so useful, it's now not being used so much for diagnosis, but it's incredibly useful once you know a man has prostate cancer because it goes up and down with the volume of the cancer, usually there are some some cases where that doesn't happen, but as a general generalisation, it does. Um, and so the treatment for that is some kind of androgen ablation or androgen um, therapy, which blocks the production of testosterone. <coughs> In the olden days, they used to castrate men. That's not done so much now. Uh, they use drugs instead to achieve that result. But the reason that the PSA goes down is that it's actually driven by, um, by androgen. So the male hormone drives the production of PSA. PSA is an enzyme which is found in the ejaculate and its role is to break down the little clot that forms in the ejaculate, um, which is called seminogelin, so that the sperm can swim out and do what they need to do. So it also makes fluids in the prostate. So PSA is controlled by androgen. So if you monitor the PSA levels, it's giving you an idea of what's happening with the androgen. And it turns out that prostate cancer is very much androgen dependent and androgen driven. So initially, um, the Chinese eunuchs who used to look after the harems uh, were all castrated and they, none of them ever developed prostate cancer. So if you didn't want to develop prostate cancer, you could become a nice boy soprano and sing up high for the rest of your life. But that isn't, of course, what happens. But it was one of the ways in which it was found that the androgen was so important. So when that goes back up, the androgen ablation usually brings the PSA down again in many patients, but there are some who then go on to have another rise in prostate cancer. So by this stage, on this end of the graph, we're now talking about more advanced disease. The beginning one was sort of early disease, but a proportion of men get advanced disease. And when we are working in research, as I am, we tend to concentrate on this end because the surgery and the radiation can work very well for many men at the early stage. So we're trying to work out how we can save men who have developed advanced stage cancer. So that's why I'm talking about that end of the spectrum. So if you're newly diagnosed, I don't want you to think that you know I'm telling you a, uh, a song of doom about your life expectancy, because I'm not. I'm trying to tell you about how 
we might treat and do things for men with late stage cancer. So when that goes up, as you can see by that brown line, um, initially the cancer is called androgen dependent or androgen sensitive. It becomes hormone refractory because um, it now doesn't seem to need the hormone anymore um, or castrate resistant. And at that time, or even a bit before it, you, it starts to spread and it spreads to other organs and in particular it goes to the bone. So bony metastases uh, sec the secondary deposits of the cancer in the bone are very common in late stage prostate cancer. So now what's happened? Oh, okay. So th this is just to explain um, what goes on in the late stage cancer. You can still treat late stage cancer in the which now don't seem to be hormone dependent with some new drugs that have been discovered. And what's happening is that the prostate cancer actually makes its own androgen. So after you've taken away the androgen by using androgen ablative therapies, um, it actually starts to make its own. It's very clever. I've always said the prostate's the second brain, but people don't <laughs> like that answer. <laughs> um, but, it, but they do. And um, there are several mechanisms by which um, this, can, this can happen. So first of all, it uses a backdoor pathway, which is not the normal pathway of metabolism for making the androgen, in order to make androgen in the prostate. And, and the androgen binds to a receptor on the cell, which is on the surface of the cell. And when it binds, it carries it inside of the cell to the nucleus of the cell, where it turns on a whole lot of genes. And um, one, another mechanism of getting over the, the need for androgen is that you get a hypersensitivity of the androgen receptor itself so that it can bind other hormones as well as, as testosterone. It can bind progesterone and estrogen and um, other kinds of corticosteroids so it doesn't need the androgen in order to perform its work. Or you can get mutations in, in, in that uh, androgen receptor, or you can have multiple copies of the androgen receptor, so that if the level of testosterone is extremely low, it can still be reactive. So the drugs have to be designed to work to overcome these kinds of mechanisms that the prostate cancer produces. Um, and this shows that backdoor pathway, so don't worry about that. But if you can understand those mechanisms, then you can actually design new therapy. So that's what this slide is really telling you. That's the take home message. So now I'm coming back to this one again, because what happens is that we really desperately need imaging to tell us, do you really have a bad prostate cancer? Do you have a cancer that isn't too bad, even though the Gleason score might say so? Should we be using um, um, surveillance? Should we, that, that means that you monitor the PSA every six months and maybe do some more imaging in a year's time. Should you be doing that or should you be going on to surgery or radiation? We need to be able to make those decisions better. And if we could image the cancer and clearly see the cancer there, we could do that with much more precision and give better advice to men as to what sort of treatment might be good for them. And similarly, if we're using treatments, these are just new treatments that have come up in the last five years. I mean, a few years ago, we didn't have any treatments for late stage cancer. Now there's a whole series of drugs some of them um, are chemotherapies, the docetaxel and cabazitaxel. The cipolucyl T is an immune type of therapy that inhibits the prostate cancer from growing. And the abiraterone and enzalutamide are aimed at attacking the androgen receptor and the testosterone. And the 223 radium is a type of, um, it's a radioactive substance which also delivers a sort of high level of radiotherapy locally. So we need to know not only for diagnosing but for treating. A lot of these treatments work in some men and not other men and they have quite nasty side effects uh, in some men and not other men. So if you're unfortunate and have a bad response and get very sick with having, say, docetaxel, we need to know, is it working so that we can stop it a bit sooner 
or should we keep going and putting people through, you know, these um, nasty side effects who aren't going to respond? But if we could image the cancer well, we could tell a bit earlier whether that's working and that would help with the management of the disease. So I've just put up here, and it's not, I don't expect you to read it, it's a great pile of clinical trials that are going on with all these new drugs. So it's just to show you that an awful lot is now happening worldwide with all these drugs. And clinical trials are usually randomised, so a patient will be given one treatment or not a treatment so that you can actually compare what would have happened to them over time. And if the clinical trials aren't done in that manner, then you can't really draw appropriate conclusions about how good the treatment is. But this is just to show you there's all these trials. And in addition, whilst I showed you a whole series of drugs that were there, we don't know if we should combine the drugs. And if we should combine the drugs or, or treat with one and then another, what order should we give those drugs in? Because sometimes if you combine them, they're better. Sometimes if you combine them, it makes it worse. And sometimes if you give one first, you can't use another one. And those kinds of um, decisions are quite difficult to make. So that's very much is going on in that space at the moment. And one of the things that happens when you use some of the new drugs is that the androgen receptor, which is a very complicated molecule, and up the top is the normal um, androgen receptor. It's got different domains. And the one on the right, which is sticking out, called LBD, is called the ligand binding domain. But what happens when you treat with these brand new drugs, which are very powerful inhibitors of androgen, is that you select for a variant of the androgen receptor which may be present already and, is, and, and it has no ligand binding domain, so it actually um, works very strongly in whether the androgen's there or not there, so you're not achieving the result that you want. And some of the new findings are that this um, particular variant, which is AR7, um, V7, is actually coming up after these therapies. And when you give those treatments, and if the patient has ARV7, you can see on the, on the slide on the left um, the uh, response of the people to drugs. So the black line is your sort of zero line. And the yellow ones have got that variant and they're not responding. The ones that are blue are responding, so they're actually getting better. So this is a new problem which has just recently come to people's notice after these very new drugs have been developed. So we still haven't really got a cure. We can prolong life and make people sort of have a chronic disease rather for, this is for advanced stage cancer. Let me stress that because if it's early stage cancer, some people respond beautifully to prostatectomy or radiation and there isn't another problem. So I'm talking about the advanced disease um, which we're trying to concentrate on. So let's talk about um, how we work out what to do. M most patients are stratified into risk strategies, risk categories, using clinical staging, which uh, uh, is based on how bad your cancer is, how sick you are, things like that. Um, the level of prostate cancer antigen in the blood and the biopsy grading. <clears throat> if they're understaged um, and the treatment is given, then that can lead to an earlier recurrence. We call it a biochemical recurrence because the PSA comes back up and that's a biochemical molecule. Whereas if they're overstaged, they might be treated with more aggressively than they need to be treated. So we need something to tell us what's going on. And we need either diagnostic tests or we perhaps, um, and what I haven't mentioned is that whilst a lot of men get prostate cancer and as you get older, um, you're more likely to get it. So by the time people are 80, 80% 80 of men have prostate cancer, but it might not be a very aggressive disease. And we still don't have a marker which tells us this disease is only going to cause changes that aren't going to really affect the man's life, and this disease is going to be really aggressive. We don't have those biomarkers yet. We're searching for them desperately, but we don't have those biomarkers. 
So what about imaging? Well, when men go to have a biopsy done, um, well, it's actually changing now, but this was the norm, that they might have a transrectal ultrasound guided prostate biopsy. So that means that probe is put in through the rectum and it goes to specific areas which are predefined in the prostate and takes little pieces so that the histology can be done and uh, something can be done about it. But if you then do a radical prostatectomy uh, on the men that have had those um, and do what's called a whole mount, which means that you cut through the whole prostate and you go through every section of the prostate. It's a huge amount of work for the pathologist to do that. They often find that the staging that, was, that came from those pre-organised biopsies is incorrect. It might be understaged or it might be overstaged. So, um, and the other problem is that if your biopsies are taken through the rectum and the cancer's on the other side of the prostate, um, it's not, it's not um, part of what's biopsy, so you can miss, it, miss out on it. So we need um, some, other, some other ways of doing it. And also, within the prostate, um, this is true for most cancers, but it's especially so for the prostate. Um, you can have multiple foci of cancers. So, you know, there might be one at the top and one next to it and down here, and, and they're all different. They're not the same. And when they spread from one tissue to, from the prostate to other tissues, they can actually spread, say, from the prostate to a lymph node or to the bone, where they form the bone metastases, and then they can spread again. And instead of spreading from the prostate, they can actually spread from the one that's in the bone to somewhere else, or they can spread from one that's in the lymph node to somewhere else. So it's in, an incredibly complicated disease to try and study and find new methods to look after. So for lymph node detection, um, they've been using MRI, that's um, magnetic resonance imaging. Has anyone had an MRI here? Yes, yeah, so you know, you know what it is. Um, and they're now using um, special types of MRI where they look at function as well as looking at the actual tumour. Um, and what had been said before was that even when you use some of the functional imaging, which I've mentioned there, diffuse weighted imaging, you can't detect a lymph node involvement unless it's bigger than eight millimetres. Eight millimetres is pretty tiny, but if it's smaller than that, you can't see it. So you actually need to use nanoparticles to enhance the MRI in order to see that um, by special techniques. So I'll tell you a bit more about those. So um, even with the, um, the special MRI, um, and they've now got a new system for grading the MRI called PIRAD, which is um, the, the um, I forget what it's called, the predictive value, um, um, you're still missing out on some of the tumours. So in the, in the PA hospital, we've now got a new instrument, which is a PET MRI, so we can do um, positive emission tomography at the same time, and I'll tell you a bit about that too. So just to, to reiterate, prostate cancer is currently imaged by transrectal ultrasound, magnetic resonance imaging, commuted tomography, which is another form of imaging, and posit positron emission tomography, but we're still not getting our answers. We need better tools, both to diagnose and assess the response. And so we set about to develop new methods to improve the imaging um, in the lab using models. Not men, but mouse models or human cancers grown in, in um, mice that are, that are immunodeficient. We can actually take biopsies from men and put them into mice, and if they haven't got a proper immune response, they will grow up and then we can see what's going on. That's how the work's done. So we started off using iron oxide nanoparticles, and we've also used hyperbranched polymers. Um, so I'll just explain those. So we found that there's an antigen, um, which is a marker, a biomarker, expressed on the surface of prostate cancer cells. It's called prostate-specific membrane antigen. 
it was discovered a long time ago by one of my colleagues who, who was at Sloan Kettering Memorial then and now in New York and is now at Cleveland Clinic. And it's um, found on, on the outside of the cells. So they made antibodies to it so that they can actually detect it. And um, in the normal epithelium of the prostate, of the normal prostate, it's inside the cell. And in prostate cancer, it changes and it goes and sits on the outside of the cell, which means that you can target it. And it's highly expressed in prostate cancer, in lymph node metastases, and also in bone metastases. Um, and it's highly expressed in lethal, what we call lethal castrate-resistant prostate cancer as well. And what, what is interesting about it is that when an antibody or something binds to the PSMA on the surface of the cell, it's got a motif in the sequence of amino acids that make up the antigen which carry it inside the cell. So that means that if we can put something onto um, a molecule that's going to bind to PSMA, we can carry it inside the cell. And our idea is to put a drug onto the PSMA targeted nanoparticles so that we can get the, the, a higher dose of treatment inside the prostate cancer cells whilst avoiding take up of drug in other tissues so that you knock out the side effects and increase the treatment where you need the treatment. And if you've got um, a marker such as PSMA and it's found on the bone metastases as well as on the lymph nodes, as well as in the prostate, if you put it into the blood, it should go and find those cancers and then it can knock out those cancers as well or image them. So um, it used to be used as a test called prostacin for finding prostate cancer, but Unfortunately, they used um, an antibody which was not made against the part that was outside the cell. It was the part that was inside the cell, so it didn't work very well. But they've now found that small molecules that bind to PSMA can be used for PET imaging. But what we did was um, we used iron oxide nanoparticles because when you use um, iron in an MRI, um, it goes darker, so it enhances the image that you can get with a normal MRI. And so I've shown that here. Um, we we um, <clears throat> made a particle like this with lots of arms on it, um, and we attached an antibody against PSMA called J591, which binds <coughs> to the outside of the PSMA on the cells. And when you inject that into a mouse, um, into we in just actually injected it into the mouse prostate to see what would happen because we weren't really sure what we were looking for, you can see you get this terrific darkening effect by the nanoparticles that are targeted. Um, then we found that they were non-toxic to prostate cancer cells, so we grew the cells and they didn't die in the presence of those. Um, so that's important if you're going to start putting them in a patient. And we also showed that they were taken up by, um, by their cells. So these show fluorescent binding. We put a fluorescent marker on the nanoparticles and you can see that it's gone into the prostate cancer cells there at the bottom. And here we've got the, the because the nanoparticles are made of iron, um, there's a stain that picks up iron. So you can see here that in the presence of the of the antibody, they're taken up much better than when they are up by themselves without the antibody. And you get a lot of blue staining inside the, the tissue. Oops. So then we did an experiment where we had mice that were injected with prostate cancer cells and the prostate cancer was actually injected into the prostate of the mice which is quite a tricky operation because it's very small. Um, and we um, either in, then injected the mice that were carrying the tumours with nanoparticles alone or targeted nanoparticles. So the nanoparticles alone are on the left and the targeted ones are on the right. 
and we looked after two hours and after 24 hours with MRI, and you can see that blackening effect that we're getting, see the red arrow on the right, and similarly at 24 hours. So that was highly successful and showed that we could increase the ability to see the tumour in this way. And you can see that I mentioned the blue stain before. Up at the top is the, is the tumour grown in the mice. And with nanoparticles alone, you got a little bit of uptake. But when you had the nanoparticles with the antibody, you got a lot of uptake. And it, and it did go a little bit to the spleen and the liver, but really not very much. So we weren't getting very much uptake in other organs. We were only getting it in the prostate tissue, prostate cancer tissue. So from that, we decided the nanoparticles are safe in the normal prostate. Um, and when we label them with the antibodies, we get much better uptake by cancer cells, and that enhances the MRI. And so they have the potential to be used as an imaging tool in patients. Now, some people have used nanoparticles before in patients that are made of iron. And unfortunately, they caused some pain and a few toxic effects in patients. So we did all this work, but now we, it hasn't moved into the clinic because there, there could be some problems. And so we're trying to develop some other methods. So the next thing was we've used these hyperbranched polymers. And they're a type of nanoparticle. Because they're hyperbranched, you can stick things on the branches. So if you think of an octopus with all these arms everywhere, we can put a targeting agent on, we can put an imaging agent on, we can put a drug on that gets delivered, and so on. So that was our idea, and these, that's just to show you. And we tried both a peptide that was made uh, from an antibody, which is a smaller molecule than an antibody. We tried the antibody, and we tried a very small molecule, or we tried the hyperbranch polymers with nothing attached and put them into mice in the same way with the tumours. So we wanted to compare the efficacy of the three. Audience question. When you say PSMA minus, do some prostate cancer cells not have PSMA? Professor Russell. In the body all prostate cancer cells have PSMA. In the laboratory we disable PSMA on some prostate cancer cells. We call these PSMA minus. Pause the video here to read more. And we did some imaging studies um, after we'd done in vitro work to show um, we chose the best one for in vivo studies. So we could show here by what's called flow cytometry, that, this, that cell, we had cells that expressed PSMA and cells that didn't express PSMA, which were control one for the other. And you can see the red ones are the ones that express PSMA and the black ones are the ones that don't. And when we treated cells in tissue culture, we got much more staining of the ones that were PSMA positive, as you can see at each time and at each dose. And for example, at 120 minutes, we were getting terrific uptake of the hyperbranch polymer with the peptide compared with um, what's being taken up in the cells that don't express the PSMA ligand. And similarly with the, peptide, with the antibody, so we got that working with both. And we could show again in um, using confocal microscopy that we were getting uptake of the nanoparticles which were labelled with a green fluorescence marker. And you can see there the very strong green fluorescence with those two molecules there. there. So then we did a mouse experiment and in this time we had the tumours labelled with a red fluorescence marker so we could see them. Um, with special imaging equipment. And we put the um, ones that had PSMA positive on one side and the ones that with PSMA negative on the other side. And you can see that when we injected our theranostic um, hyperbranch polymer with the peptide attached that binds to PSMA, we got really good imaging of the ones on the right, which were PSMA positive and there wasn't any imaging of the ones on the left. So now we're not looking at red, we're looking at green fluorescence. So you can see in the red circles there, 
you're getting very good uptake. Um, so that means it's got imaging potential. And in addition, after we'd done the imaging, we killed the mice, we euthanized the mice, and we took out the various organs and looked to see how much fluorescence we were getting in any other organs. You can see here, this is the PSMA positive tumour and the PSMA negative tumour in the liver, kidneys and spleen. So it was quite specific for prostate cancer. And then we used a small, um, small molecule and did the same thing, but instead of doing fluorescence imaging, we've done um, imaging using PET. So in this case, you have to use a radioactive isotope, which is attached to, the body, to what's binding to the PSMA. And you can see um, on the bottom, we haven't got any staining of the tumour, whereas up the top, we've got very good staining. Now, we use copper 64, but they don't use that so much in the clinic, but they can, and we just didn't have the right um, apparatus to, to make the other, anti, um, the other radioisotopes, but they're now doing it in the clinic, I'd like to show you. So just before I move on to that, you can see from those data that we were getting good binding both in tissue culture, that's in vitro, and in vivo, where we can image the tumours better with these PSMA-targeted um, molecules. <coughs> so now we're ready to, we've added the drug on. It's taken 18 months of chemistry to be able to add the drug on to those, and we're ready to test them. So the chemists have been working, my colleagues have been working very hard to get them on. So, but before that, what they've done is, um, instead of using docetaxel, they used, um, just a trial drug, which is bound to the polymers with a hydrazine, hydrazone linkage, which um, comes off when you change the pH, that's the acidity. And when it goes inside the cell and goes to the lysosome, the pH drops down to um, five or six, um, instead of being at seven. Um, and so we can, he can, we can show that at pH, Five, um, the um, polymer remains intact, but when we, I'm sorry, at pH 7, the polymer remains intact, but when we um, drop the pH to 5, we actually get it released, so that would happen inside the cell. So we've now attached the docetaxel, and we're waiting to do those experiments straight after Christmas, so we hope that it works. Now, the other thing I wanted to tell you is that there's a model of prostate cancer. The only animal which gets, only mammal which gets prostate cancer apart from man is the dog. So mice don't get prostate cancer. Horses don't get prostate cancer, dogs do. Um, and the prostate cancer that happens in dogs is like the very late stage cancer. So it's not like the early stage cancer. So, as I mentioned, um, and the other thing about it in dogs is that the cancers that form in the bone are osteoblastic, so they're making more bone, which is what happens in prostate cancer. In breast cancer, when people get cancer that goes in the bone, it's holy. It's got little holes all over the place. It's osteoporotic instead of osteoblastic. So prostate cancer is, the, uh, is very different in that it forms these very unusual bone metastases. And there's a lot of homology between dog and human genes, more than between mouse and human, as you might imagine, from evolution. Um, and the PSMA is actually expressed in the dog, and people have used small molecules to image the dog tumours. Um, and so um, what we're going to do is um, there's a new large core pet where you could do dog work at the University of Queensland in the Centre of Advanced Imaging, and we got a grant to buy that recently. Um, and in talking to the um, vets who look after the animal hospitals, they get about five dogs a month which get advanced prostate cancer. So we will try, after, if we, once we get it working in mice and use the dose tax, so we'll try it in dogs as a sort of halfway house to trying to get into a clinical trial. 
So I just missed that, I think, but I'll go back to here. So we're also doing a clinical trial of a new PET agent, which is actually binding to prostate cancer. And this was developed in Heidelberg in, um, in Germany. And the guys at um, Royal Brisbane Hospital, a guy called Paul Thomas, who does PET imaging, has got all the methodology. And so we've done a small trial where we've looked at um, 20 men. We've done MRI in the men. We've done PET imaging in the men with this new agent. And we've done a prostatectomy and then taken the prostates out and done whole mount pathology and compared the binding that we've got by M but the imaging by MRI with the imaging by PET and where the prostate cancer is in the in the um, in the prostate. Um, and I you know I mentioned before that you can only detect um, lymph node tumours that are perhaps greater than eight millimetres. With this new agent, um, you can detect tumours that are probably 2.5 millimetres. So you can detect smaller tumours. And this is showing enormous promise. And everyone around the world has jumped onto this new method for doing um, imaging of prostate cancers. And not only that, um, I'll just go through. I don't think you need. Um, so here's, here it is with the gallium. If you label it with a different um, molecule, which is called lutetium, to um, now I've forgotten two seven one seven seven lutetium, um, it actually kills the cancer. And the guy that um, that developed the PSMA and found the PSMA as a biomarker, Skip Heston, who's a colleague of mine, sent me this photo. This got some kind of award as the best photo of the year. And you can see on the right, on the, on the left-hand side on the right, there's a, a couple of tumours, uh, the two black spots with this arrow up here in the middle. And after the treatment, they completely disappeared and the PSA has dropped from 38 to 4.6. And at Peter Mac, um, they've done eight patients now um, who have advanced cancer, have failed all of the other treatments that they've been given with this new um, PSMA-targeted PET um, labelled with lutetium and they're responding and their tumours are going away. So there's great excitement. Um, it's very early, early days, but there's great excitement that this is going to revolutionise and perhaps provide a, a better treatment to follow up on the other treatments. So PSMA, PET can detect lymph nodes um, and you can actually get um, better results in those patients if you use um, uh, the, um, the PET in order to find where the lymph nodes are. And um, one of our colleagues, Ian Vila, who's come back from working in Sloan Kettering, the Sloan Kettering has worked out a method for actually growing very tiny tumours in tissue culture, and they form little organoids, or well, they call them avatars and avataroids and all sorts of things, but he's got them growing and he's brought back some of the tumours that he got growing in America for us to work on. And he's taken um, biopsies of those tiny tumours that we were picking up with the PSMA and put them into tissue culture to prove that in fact they are prostate cancers and he's been growing some of those up for us to do more experiments, experimental work with. So, in summary, we use the Theranostics. We call them Theranostics because they can be used for diagnosis, imaging, and therapy. So it's the therapy, diagnostics, blah, blah. That's the new word that's being used. Um, and they can be multiply decorated with various agents to do PET and also treatment. We're targeting them and hoping that we'll be able to um, show that the docetaxel or cabazitaxel works better when it's targeted. They can now also be done with radiotherapy. And we've attached a model drug to show that it's released at the pH that happens inside the cell. And we'll be able to verify our findings in dogs, we hope. Um, and we're also conducting some clinical trials. So I'd just like to thank all my um, 
collaborators. These guys in the middle at the Centre for Advanced Imaging and the Australian Institute of Bioengineering are, are the chemists who've been doing all the chemical work for us. Um, Brian and May have been doing all the biological work and the animal work. Skip Heston's given us some of the reagents and we've had various funding. So this is the group from the Australian Prostate Cancer Research Centre, so it's quite a big group now. So um, it's uh, firing along.